Howdy and welcome to Burley United Methodist Worship Service for Sunday, the, the 10th of September. We are grateful you could tune us in. If you're in the area, uh, we will be having our anti-racism class. Uh, we're meeting from through September to, uh, to Advent uh, after church. If you'd like to come and participate, lunch is provided. Um, our opening hymn this morning is the, the great African-American uh, hymn of promise and liberation and freedom. Lift every voice and sing. The call to worship this morning comes from the 15th Psalm and the letter to Hebrews. I will read the lighter print. I'll ask you to respond in the bold. Come in humble gratitude and longing to sit at the feet of the divine majesty. We come seeking the righteousness of God, hardly daring to stand in God's presence. All are invited to feast, to the feast of God, Come all you poor, maimed, lame, and blind. How shall we sojourn to the tents of God or dwell in God's holy hill? Jesus Christ bids us come today and forever as people are summoned long ago. For we will not fear what people may do or say. For the sovereign God, our helper, welcomes us. Please join me in the opening prayer. Across the generations we gather, holy God, 
to learn your way, to hear your judgment, and to renew our relationship with you and one another. We come seeking the faith to those who have gone before us in righteousness and truth. Lead us by your word to walk in your statutes and observe your ordinances. Amen. Our next song this morning is Shine, Jesus, Shine. The 22nd anniversary of 9-11 is tomorrow. Uh, 22 years ago, I was probably boarding uh, a plane at uh, the Southwest International Airport in Victorville, uh, heading home to Fairbanks, Alaska after a, a month long training exercise out at Fort Irwin in the Mojave Desert. Little did I know that the world would change as soon as I got home. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. 
Let us remember those families that were forever changed. For with those that were on the plane, not knowing. And for those who have gone to Iraq and Afghanistan these last two years and gave their full measure of devotion, let us pray. Oh Lord, on this day, death is all around us. Merciful God, hear our prayers. The world groans with pain. Hear our prayers for your warring world. And yet, Lord, we do not come this day downheartened, but with hope. For we pray that the rulers of the nations will heed and yearn for your wisdom. Lord, we pray for your church, for it is divided this day. Hear our prayers for peace and unity. Lord, even after a month has happened with the fires in Hawaii, your children still suffer there. For they are hungry and there is still no rest. Hear our prayers for those who are poor or who have no homes. Oh Lord, for many of us, we are sick. And for some of us, we are facing our last days. Hear our prayers for healing and peace. Our hearts are troubled, Lord. Guide us until we find our rest in you. Hear our secret prayers. And merciful God, we give you thanks. For you are faithful and your love never ends. Gather our prayers and conform them to your will. This we pray in Jesus' name, who taught his disciples when they prayed to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are working our way through the book of Acts. Acts is the addition or the addendum to Luke's gospel. Luke was a, a traveling companion of the apostle Paul. Paul was not one of the original 12, but who he was not one of the 12 who walked the dusty roads of, of Israel with Jesus, but rather he was kind of a, a Johnny come lately who encountered Jesus after our Lord's return to heaven. There on the road of Damascus, back when his name was Saul, had probably the first of many close and personal encounters with Jesus. And the first meeting that he had with our Lord turned his life around 180 degrees. Our Lord promises the same experience to all who are willing to submit and repent and turn toward him. In your Bible, if you do not have one with you, take the one in front of you home. And starting with Acts and skimming through the, the, the rest of the 23 books through Revelation, you will find that the writers of Paul and Peter and John 
refer to what they are doing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Just before our Lord left, he told his disciples that they would receive the Holy Spirit. If you have bowed your knee to Jesus, the Holy Spirit, rest assured, has come and lives in you now. The second chapter of Acts is probably the the most read chapter in that book because what happened on that day of Pentecost was so dramatic that the arrival of the Holy Spirit came upon 3,000 people and they believed that day in Jesus. The promise then is as true today that when we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to serve Christ, we will work to work to, to achieve the completion of the kingdom of heaven. The Holy Spirit first came to the Jews, but back in Acts 8, we read that it came to the Samaritans, their cousins. And then finally, they came to the Gentiles, that's you and me. From last week, we read, while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit came upon all who were hearing the word. And the Jewish believers were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out, poured out even upon the Gentiles. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Peter and his entourage were astounded. They were blown away that the Holy Spirit had come upon these Gentiles. This was big news that was spread quickly to all believers, Jews and Gentiles alike. But not all the Jews were thrilled by receiving this news flash. We open chapter 11. Now when the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word. What had been for a time kept within the confines of the church of Jerusalem who had all grown up as Jews. The power of the Holy Spirit had been shared with only them. But things had exploded and their cousins, the Samaritans, and now they hear the Gentiles, the Gentiles of all people, now have the Holy Spirit in them. And for some of these Jewish Christians, this was a pill that was too hard to swallow. We hear a universal appeal of the good news of Jesus Christ in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes, that whosoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Whosoever, one's ethnicity doesn't matter. One's gender doesn't matter. One's race doesn't matter. No distinction will be made about who will be welcomed for all are. The one thief on the cross got saved that day, his last day of life. And I bet he never went to church. The Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to his disciple Timothy that it is God's desire that every person, all people everywhere would be saved. For these last several months, Peter 
has been on his own spiritual tilt a wheel. Remember, if you've been to the fair, the ride that you kind of belt yourself in while standing, in addition to feeling the centrifugal force of going around and around, and, I don't know, stop. The ride also tilts up and down, and when you finally get off that ride, the last thing you want to do is to eat anything greasy. Peter had been in his own tilt a wheel after his vision of clean and unclean animals, being told to take the gospel message to Cornelius and even seeing the Holy Spirit descend upon him and his family and his friends. Peter grew up a good Jew. Good Jews marry within their tribe. Good Jews go to temple as often as they can. Good Jews seek daily to follow the law of Moses. Good Jews never miss a Passover. And good Jews have as infrequent dealings with Gentiles as possible. And now for all of these principles are torn up and thrown away, thrown into the fire, what Peter has experienced with Cornelius. Peter's time with him changed him just as Paul's experience with our risen Lord on the road to Damascus. The news of this experience in Cornelius' house spread quickly. The old saying, bad news travels fast. And so when Peter got up to Jerusalem, the Jewish believers criticized him saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? The reaction of these believers in Jerusalem was, you did what? With whom? Peter was so thrilled that the Gentiles now had the gospel, but those back in Jerusalem could not rid of themselves of their racial prejudices. The Christian author Frederick Buechner wrote about this encounter with a dash of humor. With the smell of ham and shellfish still on his breath, people were not amused with Peter, but God said, get over it. They were not only unamused, they were ticked off. They could not believe that Peter, of all people, would go into the house of a Roman army officer in Caesarea of all places and accept the hospitality of a Gentile. Gentiles were dirty. After a Gentile, after an, after an encounter with a Gentile, you needed to take a, a, a shower spiritually as well as physically to associate with Gentiles at that time was to associate with dogs. And what a horrible thing to say about one's canine friends. Did not Peter back in chapter 10 react the same way when these folks, when the angels confronted him praying? Peter was just as standoffish at the beginning as those of Jerusalem were now. When Peter received that vision, he said, you want me to do what with whom? Those things just weren't done by good Jews. And as far as Peter's colleagues were concerned, the old rules going all the way back to Moses still applied. And the first application I have today is, what old rules 
still apply to you today. Peter now wants to bridge that gap. He seeks to stand in the breach and we continue on in Acts 11. And when Peter began to explain it, saying, I was in Joppa praying and I saw a vision. And there was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven. I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles and birds. I heard a voice saying to me, get up, kill and eat. And I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing as profane has ever entered my mouth. And at that moment, men from Caesarea arrived and the spirit told me to go with them and do not make distinction between them and us. Six others accompanied me and we entered Cornelius' house. And he told us how he had been seen, how he had seen the angel saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon Peter. And he will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptizes with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? The takeaway from this passage is that when the Holy Spirit makes a move, get out of the way. Don't gum up the works. Allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. Be open to the Holy Spirit and stop being stubborn, which I am guilty way too much. Peter said, the Holy Spirit came upon them just as they came upon us. And Peter meant going all the way back to Pentecost in Acts 2. <clears throat> what Peter is saying here is what happened to us way back then happened again. But this time it was the Gentiles who experienced the Holy Spirit. Three times here we read about a voice who spoke to Peter. That was the Holy Spirit. What was just as important as the Holy Spirit speaking to Peter is that Peter listened and obeyed. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could hinder God? Is it possible that we get in God's way to the point that we hinder the work of the Holy Spirit? I think so. One way we hinder the work of the Holy Spirit is when we turn away or when we ignore God's gift of living the abundant life. John in his gospel wrote, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. When we stay silent after we sin and do not repent, we become like King David but he repented and he wrote in Psalm 32, when I keep silence, my body wastes away through my groaning all the day long for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat of the summer. As I told my soldiers in chapel, when you mess up, Confess up, confessing to God, being as specific as possible, allows God to bless you as specifically as possible. And when we do what we experience God 
just as David experienced when he wrote, and then when I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you will forgive the guilt of my sin. Second, God wants us to be free. We are imprisoned by the bars of our making, not by forgiving others. The Apostle Paul would write to the church in Ephesus, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgive one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. When we do not forgive, we are blocking God from blessing us fully. And third, God wants us to grow up, be mature believers. I have found the more God is at work in me, the more I become more like Jesus Christ and less like me. For even after all of these years, there is still a lot of room for improvement. But this requires dedication, maturity, and focusing on what is important in life. The writer of Hebrews has words for all of us who have been doing this Jesus thing for quite a while now. For though by this time, you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic elements and oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk still is an infant, is unskilled in the words of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the faculties that have been trained by practice to distinguish between good and evil. And fourth, God wants to use us to reach those whom God has not yet reached. God wants us to proclaim the gospel to those who have not heard it. Peter told his Jerusalem friends that the gospel is for everyone. The Apostle Paul writes about the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is for Jews and Gentiles alike. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you through the body is dead because of sin, the spirit of life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies and also through his spirit that dwells in you. Go back to everything that you have learned in Sunday school and in your devotions and in reading your Bible about the crucifixion and Easter and ask, who pulled all of this off? And the answer is the Holy Spirit made all of this happen. Paul is writing that the same spirit that lives in you is the one that lives in Christ. A Christian is anyone, Jew or Gentile, who has the Holy Spirit living inside of them. If you have repented of your sins and trust in Jesus in your salvation, knowing why you need to repent will not save you. Sin, as King David wrote, eats away. Sin is a spiritual leprosy. By repenting of your sin, rest assured that you have been forgiven and you have been born again. Amen. With this, you are secure and sealed for the day to come that you will see God. Paul writes to the Ephesians, in him you also, 
when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and have believed in him, or marked with the seal and the promise of the Holy Spirit, this is the pledge of your inheritance towards redemption of God's own people to the praise of his glory. I do not believe in backsliding, the human ability to lose one's faith and salvation. The Apostle Paul right here states that your salvation has been sealed in the power and in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Those who were ticked off that Peter at the beginning of all of this had a collective change of heart. And we end the passage with these words. When they heard this, they were silenced and they praised God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to eternal life. Have you done this? I really hope so. And in so doing, you will join in with them, Peter's followers praising God. Repent now and receive the Holy Spirit and eternal life. Let us pray. Hear me, O Lord, as I make my confession. I thank you for receiving me as I am, not as I pretend to be, for I am tired of pretending. Forgive me for the time that I have succeeded in deceiving my family and my friends, for I know I can never deceive you. I know that just as I have sinned against my neighbor and have sinned, I have also sinned against you. Loving God, I know that in my ignorance I have stood in the way of others' discovery of your will and your presence. Oh God, forgive me. Forgive me for thinking too often about myself and my own wants and seldom thinking of theirs and their needs. Oh God, give me a heart of a servant. Oh God, forgive me that I have been unwilling to forgive others. Oh God, forgive me for I have criticized others to inflate my own importance. I ask for a generous heart. Remind me, O oh Lord, to say kind things to others. Be selfless to do the things for others and gratitude to live my life for others. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. The writer of Amazing Grace 
before he became a Christian, was a captain of a ship who brought cargo from Africa to the New World. His cargo was living, breathing people, men, women, and children. John Newton was part of the slave trade. He, like Peter and Paul, had a conversion of spirits that changed his life. He got out of the shipping business and became an Episcopalian priest. And he wrote the words of amazing grace, words of repentance, words of hope, words of eternal life. So let us sing the great American spiritual, Amazing Grace. Go out and leave this place to be Christ's hands and Christ's feet and do not be afraid. The creator of all that is uphold your life. Christ himself walks beside you and the Holy Spirit gives you breath to speak God's grace and to sing God's peace. Let us go this day. Be with him and be in peace and pray tomorrow, amen.